Hi there, my name is Alex Shulayev and I'm very happy to see all of you here at this second part of the very exciting webinar Building Cloud Native Applications with Micronaut and Grawl VM. And of course, our wonderful, wonderful uh, lecturers, speakers are Venkat Subramaniam and Graham Rocher. And those are, they are both were here uh, in the previous part one which is also available on YouTube if you would like to check it out. And they're here and we, we will continue building cloud native applications. So with all that out of the way, uh, please welcome our speakers, Venkat, how are you doing? Great, Alec, thanks for having us here, appreciate it. Rem, uh, what about you? Great to be here again, Alec, and a bit excited for what's to come. Excellent. Excellent, very much. Thank you very much. Okay, then without further ado, I will uh, leave the word and the microphone and the stage to Mr. Venkat. And uh, Venkat, the stage is yours. And if there are any questions in the chat, and if you're watching this live, I encourage you to talk to us in the chat. Any questions, any moments that are not fully uh, clear to you, uh, I'm sure the more interactive the session is, the better it is for everyone because we will all learn more from it that way. Uh, so ping us in chat, ask the questions, uh, and uh, I'm sure we can find a way to forward them to Venkat and Graham. All right, well, thank you so much again, appreciate it. Thanks, uh, Leg, and thanks, Graham, for this opportunity to speak. And uh, I wanna thank everyone who has taken the time to join. Uh, please do ask questions along the way. Let's make it as interactive as we can. Uh, and, uh, and as you have questions, uh, we'll try to get that answered. And of course, we have Graham here, who is uh, definitely one of the key persons behind the scenes, uh, uh, the author of the framework that I'm going to talk about. So we couldn't expect any better source to hear from. So do take advantage of this and ask questions. And I look forward to learning along the way as well. Let's talk a little bit about what we did in part one. I want to uh, set us uh, to where we left off last time. And then we will talk about things we're going to uh, do today in terms of how we can create microservices and how we can uh, program for things we often expect from an enterprise application running on a cloud native platform. So let's first talk about what we did last time uh, before we continue with this one. You do have access to the recording from the last one, just in case you missed the last uh, part one. Uh, please do take the time to review it later on. But quickly, what we did was we talked a little bit about what is Micronaut? Why would we want to use a, a, a framework like Micronaut? What are some of the benefits it provides? And just to quickly highlight, one of the key things about Micronaut for me is that it makes life embarrassingly simple and easy to develop with. And as a result, I'm not putting a lot of time and effort building application. I'm able to focus on my business logic or work that I want to do for my application and the infrastructure sits behind the scene and makes things work for me. Uh, Micronaut uh, not only improves developer productivity, it also gives really good performance at runtime as well because of the compile time meta programming. So it performs ahead of time compilation. So rather than using reflection at runtime, it is able to compile things and generate the metadata and, and uh, all the things needed at compile time. Now, uh, that's basically the benefit we saw, but also last time we created a little application which provides a stock information, a client that reads that information. And then we turned that into a reactive API where we were able to stream the data from the server and then be able to receive it on the client side as well. So we saw both of those things in the last presentation. But also in part one, we saw how to build to the JVM, but we also saw how to build to the Graal VM as well. And we saw the substantial difference in performance, both in terms of startup time, but also in terms of request time as well. And, and that's exactly where we left off last time. Well, now today we're gonna continue right from that point onwards. We're gonna talk about where we can take this to some of the microservices details and building for the cloud itself. So if let's take a look at the code really quickly, what we did, because I'm gonna build on that code quite a bit today. So if you look at the code we developed last time, we have a stock class, as you can see, which is just a POJO right now, and it contains a ticker and a price 
a constructor for setting the ticker and a price, and of course, getters and setters as you would expect. So that's the stock class itself. Then we have a stock service, which really fakes some data as you can see in here. And all it is doing is simply returning back some fake data of the request we are making. I'm gonna just change the setting here so that the uh, ID doesn't complain about it. So right there, we have a fake data of some uh, you know, stock prices we created. Obviously the data is in memory. We wanna take this further to persistent data today. And then we are returning the stock price right here from the stock service. Now notice that I marked it as a singleton here to tell a micronaut not to keep creating instances of this, but to create one instance and share it across different requests that may come in. Well, the last thing I wanna show you here is the stock controller, where the controller is, uh, it, we are injecting into the controller the stock service. And this is a constructor-based injection, which works really nicely no need to waste our time with annotations. And Micronaut knows at compile time to wire the dependency in by generating the bytecode that's necessary. So there's no runtime expense. We talked about this last time. The get stock function gets a stock and returns it if it finds it, otherwise gives a null. On the other hand, get stocks is returning all the stocks. But just to you know, illustrate the flavor, I have a flowable from Rx Java, which is simply returning in this case and at an interval emitting one data at a time. So we can actually see this data being emitted when we execute the application. We'll take a look at this in just about a second, but let's fire up and run this code to see how that's actually functioning. So once this starts up by default, it starts up on port 8080, as you can see. So I'm going to go over to the command prompt right here and bring up the HTTP localhost. And let's go ahead and say, in this case, localhost. And let's ask for Goob, for example, as a stock price, but at port number, of course, 8080, which is what I'm going to request for right there. So when I make a request, you can see the price came back with a value of 2,600 right there. But if I were to go back to this and make a request again, you can see that it's pulling in the data from the server and displaying all the stock prices. But of course, I wanna see that as the data is emerging. So what I'm gonna do for that purpose is to go back to this and say no buffer so that we can actually see the data as the data arrives or emerges. So that's a stream of data that we are noticing from the reactive API we generated. So that's basically an example of how the server is rendering that particular data. Likewise, really quickly, we created a client last time, but we created an interface called a stock client. That interface has been marked with the stock client right there. And then we marked it to I'll provide the get stock method from the slash ticker uh, in, uh, uh, endpoint. And of course, we are using that information in here by asking the stock price. Well, Micronaut, again, at compile time, implements that interface to do all the wiring to talk to the back end and get the data and parse it. And, and of course, you know, deserialize it and hand over stock information back to us. And again, in this case, we have a stock with only one difference, which is to have a two string method added on the client side. In the spirit of microservices, we have kept that uh, code separate in this particular case. So if I go back and run the client side code, you can see that it's gonna pull that data from the server side for the two sticker symbols. And you can see from the output being produced right here, it shows the stock price for ORCL and MSFT like so. So this is where we left off last time. And of course, we also looked at compiling to Java uh, a virtual machine, bytecode, and also to compile to native code in uh, a Graal VM. And we saw the performance differences last time, but I won't go into that again this time. I wanna start building on this. Now, one of the caveats in what we did here, which is kind of not so pleasant is, if you notice, we provided the endpoint as port 8080. Absolutely, we don't want to hard code those things. When we're running on a cloud environment, obviously, we want to discover where a service is and be able to use. And that's what we want to start with to begin with today is to look at the service discovery. And, and again, like I mentioned earlier, Micronaut makes things extremely easy. So we simply get our work done rather than fighting with APIs and library and so on. Just a few little things to learn and off we are to really put this to good use. 
So for service discovery, you got a couple of different options and you can configure more things if you want to. For example, you could use council, you could use uh, other uh, mechanisms as well. So I'm gonna just use council here to show how we can actually build this dependency in here. So first of all, I'm gonna run the server. So I'm gonna go back to the server itself the service that we are running. So I'm gonna configure the service so that we'll be able to tell it to run across on a different uh, port uh, altogether. So of course, like I mentioned, I wanna really use console right now. So I'm gonna get that started right away. So I go over here to run within Docker. I'm gonna ask it to bring up and run console right there. So that's gonna keep running on the screen. So I'm not gonna bother with it right now. We'll, we'll come back and take a peek at it one more time a little later on. But let's get back to the services application right here. Now, I want to be able to add the feature for the council. Now, the question is, what kind of dependencies do I need to bring in? Now, in an ideal world, we may know everything we need to know before we get started. But in a realistic world, we figure it out. We incrementally discover things. We add features. So in this example, as you can see, I'm in this project right now but I wanna know what dependencies I need to bring in to use console. Now, this is another place where Micronaut makes life really, really easy, where it guides you along with what you need to do. So when you create your project, when you say create app, for example, you know, app name, you can provide the features you want as a list of features. But again, like I mentioned, a lot of times we discover what features we want along the way. So it's unfair to say you need to know everything before you get started. So now that we created this application, the question is what can I do now that I know that I need one more feature? So I go into the command line tool right there and I'm gonna ask for a feature diff like so. And then I'm gonna say features and the feature I'm really looking for right now is a discovery using console and I wanna know what are the things I need to bring in. And notice right off the bat, Micronaut was able to compare my current project with what it should be. And it's able to tell me the things I need to do. So for example, it tells me in the build.gradle file, I need to put an in, uh, implementation to bring in the dependency to Micronaut discovery client, right? So it's question of really being able to copy and paste it at this point. And I can simply say, you know, here's a build.gradle file. And I'm gonna go in and say, bring in the dependency into the Micronaut uh, discovery client. So I'm gonna just bring that in here, as you can see, and, and put in that to the dependency. Well, the next thing you notice over here is it is telling me that I need to make a change. Isn't that pretty awesome to the application.yml? And I'm going to get, again copy that right there and go over to the application.yml and simply paste it right in there, as you can see. So this is simply telling me that I want to use a council right here. So I'm going to get rid of the uh, a plus right there. So you can see that I simply said, bring in the console and uh, go ahead and use that port 8500, which is the port on which I started console a few minutes ago uh, in Docker. So now that I've done that, I need to do one more thing in here. I'll come back to that in just a minute. And then of course you can examine very other details. If you really want to look at other things, you could look at anything else to be added. But I'm gonna do one more thing while we are here. I'm gonna tell my app application not to bind to the port number anymore. So I'm gonna go here to the server and say, the port is gonna be an arbitrary port, you know, assign that randomly and get started. So this helps me to not bind to a particular port number, allows me easily to create multiple versions of my applications as well, or instances rather at runtime. So that's the configuration I'm gonna leave behind here. So that's a very simple and minimum configuration again, the diff, uh, feature diff really helped us with most of the things we need here. So we didn't have to really work too hard to get that working. So now I'm gonna go ahead and get this started obviously in here. So I'm gonna just fire up the service right now and execute it. And when I start it right now, you can see that it starts on port number, some arbitrary port 58141, and it registered with council here as well. As you can see right there, it comes in and registers the stock info into council. So now we can discover the service using council. So we don't have to hard code the binding between this makes our life a lot easier. 
So let's see how we're going to do this on the client side. Well, first of all, I'm going to go to the client. I'm going to make one small change in here. If you notice the application that we here, I see here, I gave a name called the stock info, which is the name which, with, which, uh, with which we registered into council. So in here, I'm going to simply say, that's the stock info that I'm interested in uh, talking to. And then, of course, I go to the application.yml, and I'm going to say, rather than going into that port 8080, I don't want to do that anymore. So what am I going to do instead in this particular case? Well, in this case, of course, I want to be able to talk to the client in a dynamic manner in here as well, much like we uh, you know, can get the access to multiple different services. So I'm going to simply ask it to use counsel again on the client side. Now I go into the stock client like you saw and made it a stock info. Now we are ready to really run the client and see how this is going to pull in. And again, notice that I didn't have to change any code really, just be consistent in what I'm using as a name of the service. And I go fire this up and execute it this time again. And this is going to go talk to the service that's running, discover it and pull it in. Well, at least in theory, it should have brought it in. Let's see what the error actually tells us here. So it's giving us an error. It says no available service with ID stock info. It's complaining right there. Well, let's take a look at it again. So I go back to the client. I call it as a stock info right there. I go into the application.yml. And in the application YML, I want to really make sure that I'm referring to the proper uh, location right here. So let me look up my uh, uh, application.yml. And I'm simply saying, here is the stock client. And it's going to talk to the council and the client and bring it back. So I need to figure out why that was not too happy with the filing of the request. Well, that's running, obviously, right there. So it should have really, oh, of course, of course, of course, one minor detail I forgot. I did not bring in the dependency into the uh, discover, uh, the client isn't it. The devil is in the details, as they say. So I need to add in the dependency. So obviously, without it, it doesn't know it's using counsel. So as a result, it did not bother to read the part of the application.yml. So now that I drop that in right there, now it's going to know to go parse that part of the application.yml and make use of it. Well, let's go ahead and try that one more time. I, I love it when things don't work, actually, because that also helps us to learn a little bit deeper about uh, what things are to be wired up and how things work. So right now we run it and you can see it was able to pull that in and bring that in. So that's basically how it's communicating. Now the benefit of this is we can easily run multiple services and the client can go discover the service that's available. Well, that's great so far, but the one other benefit of this is almost for free, once we go into this mode, we got load balancing available. Well, by default, Micronaut already supports round robin selection. So in other words, every single request will go to a different instance of the service that's running as it is discovering. If you really wanna wire other algorithms you can do that as well for whatever reason, if round robin is not really a good technique for your particular application, you can go ahead and wire up another algorithm. But one of the really nice things about this approach is you can get things working with round robin. If it satisfies your requirements, you don't have to waste your time with anything else. But if you really need something else other than that, you can then invest your time and effort at a later time rather than having to spend your effort on it in the beginning. So you can amortize the cost of that as time goes on, get something working, and then come back and improve once you understand what you really, really want to do. Notice that I'm not really making any code change at all right now, except I'm going to stop the application that is running right now. And I go back to the command prompt right here, and I'm going to go ahead and run W assemble, and I'm going to ask it to uh, compile the code into a jar file and create a jar file out of it. Once that is done, what I'm going to do in that case is I'm going to go ahead and ask it to, uh, I'm going to fire up another terminal, and across these two terminals, I'm going to run uh, two separate instances. So I'm going to run jar uh, Java, and I'm going to say minus jar, and let's go to the build directory libs and then stock info all dot jar. And I'm going to run that particular service right in here. 
Now, obviously, when I run the service, I would really like to know what service I'm actually using. So let's do something a little different here. So let's go back to the get stocks function that you see here. And in the get stock function, let's go ahead and say output. We will say received, let's say request, let's say request uh, for, and uh, let's go ahead and output right now the ticker so we can actually see that it's receiving the request for it. So this will help us to see which one is processing purely for our information purpose. So I added that one liner. Let's go back here and do the build of the code one more time. And then let's go ahead and fire up and execute our service, but we're gonna run two separate instances at this particular point. So let's go ahead and run the first instance right there, and let's run the second instance right there as well. As you would expect, you can see the first one got registered on port 16108, and the second one in uh, port 1042. Now that these two are executing right here, let's go to the client, and I didn't make any change to the client, except notice one thing though. We received uh, one reference to a stock client right here, but then we make two separate requests on exactly the same interface right now. So we said stock client, get me the price for or RCL and get me the price for MSFT. So when I execute this code right here, you can see that it's gonna produce the result for us and you can see that the values came back but I'm curious who actually served this request. So when you notice over here, notice the request for MSFT was served by the instance that you see on the left side and for ORCL, the one on the right side, as you can see. So if I go back here and execute the code one more time, you can see the request come through and you can see those processing the request right again. So this seems to be doing the first one, this being the second one, and they're just taking turn to provide it. And of course, if I were to start yet another service, it's gonna load balance between the three instances, as you would see. Again, as soon as we provided the discovery that simply worked out of the box without us doing any extra effort. And, and again, of course, if you really want to, you can spend your time and effort configuring this even further, but otherwise you can get moving and you got load balancing almost with no effort, as you can see in this case, completely baked in. But of course, when it comes to creating uh, microservices and, and any realistic application, one of the things we always have to plan for is when things will fail. So creating failure as a first class citizen is something really important. Well, on one hand, we wanna handle failures gracefully, but even better, if we're able to recover from failures and move forward, that is even better. Well, one of the things that Micronaut provides for us off the, out of the box is an ability to configure things to be uh, repeated. So if a request were to fail, you can ask Micronaut to go repeat a request and retry, but built on top of that is a very fantastic feature for a circuit breaker. So stepping back a little bit, in developing any realistic uh, distributed uh, solution, we should really think about having circuit breakers. But what is the purpose of a circuit breaker? Well, there are a couple of things that we normally need, need to keep in mind. When you have a failure of a service, the failure could be transient or a failure may take a little longer to process. But here's one of the problems you often see in, in distributed computing. I'll share with you, I'll share with you one experience I will never ever forget uh, in my life. And this was a big lesson I learned while trying to address this problem. I was uh, asked by a client to come in and, and help them to fix a problem they've been having for two full years. Now, it's very nerve wracking as a consultant because you're walking into a building of strangers and you're gonna help them fix a the problem they've been having for two years, knowing absolutely nothing. Well, if there's one thing I know very clearly is I don't know a lot of stuff. So the only way I'm able to solve this problem is if I work with them closely and understand what's going on and try to fix it. So I'm trying to really understand why they are having this problem in production. And they had one senior developer who has at the fingertip literally two years worth of log files. Before I could you know, complete my sentence, when I say a date and time, he would have the uh, log file in front of me because he's analyzed it for nearly a year. So he knows everything about log files. So we are sitting there and asking the question, 
who is using the application when the application is you know becoming non-responsive and the answer is we, we can't figure out because it's everything all over the map so i spent nearly you know seven hours six hours with them with no clue and they're getting very frustrated because they brought in a consultant who also has no clue at this point right so we're sitting and analyzing it and then finally i asked them please bear with me who's using the application 30 minutes before one hour before and then we say i said one and a half hours before and then we notice there's one client from malaysia who's been using the system 90 minutes before every day the application becomes not responsive 90 minutes before and then we look at the data and look at the client's data in production. And as we are looking at it, one of the developers in the corner of the room simply says, oh, and it turns an explicit. And we all pause and look at him and said, what happened? He's like, I know it's my problem. I assume this data exists. And then we said, what happens if it doesn't as it doesn't in this case? He said, I throw more messages on the queue requesting and the failure happens. I keep requesting more messages. Well, this is a case where a failure caused more failures and degradation of the performance of the network, it entirely brought the entire network down. So the cost happens at something like 12.30 a.m. and the effect is two o'clock in, in, in the night, everything shuts off and doesn't become any, it becomes non-responsive. So the model of the story is, you know, it's kind of like what we all notice, right? You're driving on the freeway and the traffic is extremely slow, but why? Because everybody pauses to see where the accident is and, and we call it rubbernecking and we are curious why things went wrong. This is how systems degrade when there is a failure. Circuit breakers are intended to mitigate that particular problem. So what we want to do is, we want to retry when a failure happens, but we also want to close the network when, uh, when, when, the, the, when there's a problem so that we don't keep pinging on a server that has failed and give time for us to heal before we go back and make a request. So what if we can mix this idea of load balancing with circuit breakers to do a failover? Well, that's already built in with, again, almost no effort on our side. And the degradation is baked in by default to degrade at an exponential delay of one second, two second, and three second, and so on. And the circuit breaker can do the retry for us. Again, these default settings, it can reset after 20 seconds if the service becomes available. So let's take a look at an example of how this can be done with, with our little example that we saw in here. So I go back to the service right now, and in the service, I'm gonna receive the request right there, but I'm gonna do a little bit of a work right here. So I'm gonna say if, and in this case, I'll say math.random is greater than 0 0.8, then what do I wanna do? I'll simply say simulating a failure. So I'm gonna say that I'm simulating a failure at this point. Then I'm gonna simply say throw new runtime exception and what do we want to say here? Well, let's put something like we often see in production, uh, oops, uh, and then very informative, something uh, you know, went wrong, and we will provide that information right there. So in this case, as you can see, we have simulated a failure at one time to blow up when something were to, uh, to simulate something were to go wrong at, at a random time in this particular application. Let's go ahead and fire this up and see how this is going to work. So let's go ahead and build the code right now and, and fire up those two requests right there and start the uh, two instances of the service again in this particular case for us to be able to use. So here you go, we have the two services executing. And as we know, at random time, these two things are going to, uh, one of these uh, is going to fail. So let's go back to this code and, uh, you know, go ahead and uh, complete this and call this a few times so we can see that in execution as time goes on. But of course, when I run this code, unfortunately, you can see that it starts getting the data, but it also fails because the service blew up on my face. So what do I wanna do? Well, I wanna go to the client and say, hey client, do me a favor. If things were to go wrong, we want to really fail over and be able to handle it along the way so we don't have to really deal with the failure and accept it. So what are we gonna do? All I'm gonna do is to simply say on the client API, I'll simply bring in the circuit breaker 
So that's the only change I made right there and did not bring in anything else at this point. So now I go back and execute the client. So once we uh, you know, mark that uh, client with uh, annotation to say, I want the circuit breaker in place, how is this going to work? So here is a request, as you can see. And when I make the request, if the request passes, we get the data. But if the request were to fail, internal to the implementation of that interface, the code will perform a catch and decide to do a retry automatically at the time. So the implementation internally takes care of it. So even before I come to the next line of code, uh, my request would have succeeded rather than failing, assuming that there is a, another service that's available to respond to my request. So let's go ahead and fire this up and see what it's gonna do on this side right now. And as you can see, you are looking at the delay a little bit right there. You can see the reason for the delay, now you know why, is because a service most likely failed and you had to really make the request internally to get the response back. But if you keep your eyes over here, you can see both the services have been failing right there as they were receiving the request, as you see. And you can see that it, it, it says that it received the request right there, but it's simulating a failure, but that failure did not propagate to the client side only because, well, the client side received the failure and made a retry automatically. You can, of course, configure this quite a bit if you really wanted to, and you can go back to the uh, circuit breaker and you can configure various parameters. For example, you can say what the attempted uh, retry should be, number of attempts should be. You can uh, you know, change a few other parameters as well in here uh, as to what the reset uh, time should be. So these things are very easily configurable on the annotation, or you can simply work with the default value if, if that's what you prefer. So that gives you an idea about how really simple and easy it is to bring in some of these very important uh, uh, production ready features into Micronaut without having to spend too much time and effort. Well, I'm gonna switch gears to talk about working with data, but I wanna yield to see if there are any questions or comments, any thoughts that we wanna discuss before we move on to the next topic. So I'll yield back and, and see if there are any questions or comments at this time. Well, like right. any there, questions or comments? Yeah, there are actually no questions. There are a few few people saying that they enjoy this presentation immensely and that this is a very, very good demonstration, liking the features, both the circuit breaker and the feature diff. Feature diff is like, I learned about that just now and I think it's an excellent feature myself. So uh, that, that was very interesting, but uh, I don't think there are any questions currently happening. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Oh, uh, probably provide some. Probably provide some commentary on the discovery client if uh, discussion if we wish. Please. Uh, so um, awesome presentation so far. Thank you. The, the discovery client uh, feature in Micronaut is actually one of my my favorites. Um, it's like a general abstraction. So you know you've been demonstrating console in this uh, presentation. And the console is one of the um, service discovery mechanisms that are supported, but it's it's really like a general um, abstraction of all service discovery. So you can like plug in um, support for a whole bunch of different implementations. Uh, so uh, some of them, some of the popular ones that we see used quite often um, are things like the Micronaut Kubernetes module, uh, which uh, which essentially falls, uses Kubernetes service discovery under the hood. Um, then there's the console and the Eureka support. And then there's also uh, support for various uh, cloud modules uh, as well. So uh, things like AWS Route 52, I think it's called. Uh, um, and, um, and so on and so forth. So there's lots of different uh, ways you can back the discovery mechanism want to, you could even invent your own, right? If you wanted to discover services in your own custom me mechanism. And the cool thing is, is that it keeps your application like portable, right? So that you, so for example, if you're not ready to go to Kubernetes today, but you're thinking about it like 
in the future that one day you want to run your service on Kubernetes, you know, you don't need to change any of your source code to, uh, to uh, uh, move uh, from using kind of explicit service of discovery um, uh, to using uh, more complex uh, systems such as Kubernetes, which, you know, uh, so you can gradually evolve your code from initially, as, as you have done in the presentation, where you were initially using hard-coded values all the way up to, you know, um, using whatever the support mechanism that you want to think. Um, it's, uh, it's a cool feature and it's uh, uh, and very well demonstrated, so well done. Yeah, that, that's, that's one of the things I really like about the solution here is it's kind of like pay as you go, but you pay in micro pennies rather than in huge dollars, right? So it's, it's a very yeah. incremental approach. That's what I really like about it. And, and, and you kind of reach into things uh, along the way incrementally uh, as and when you need it. So you're not really hit on your face with, oh my gosh, I've got to invest in all these things upfront. And, and that's one of the beautiful thing is you, you can take the time to develop good quality code and then bring in the other features incrementally. So I, I'm really a huge fan of that. And also to, you know, uh, to kind of spring, uh, sing the praise of it a little bit more, you know, having done some of these other uh, frameworks and tools, um, the fact that I don't have to struggle a lot to implement it is, is another thing that I really, really honestly enjoy. I can't emphasize that is, is uh, I'm, I'm all about less effort on my part and more results for my application. And so, so that is a big win uh, that, that I continue to see in this, in this area. Yeah, definitely. I think that, um, you know, we, it, it, it's, it was real a challenge to think about like how you can like scale a framework from like really simple applications where you, you know, a lot of folks just want to like really simple application without any cloud features and, and other folks want you know all these integrations between uh with, with cloud services and it's console and so forth so um i think uh i think getting you know getting the balance right there with mark nord was a challenge but i am glad that uh that, <laughs> that feedback is is that uh we have kind of allowed those kind of simple use cases to, get, to scale up to larger ones that's awesome excellent so I want to talk about two other things somewhat related to each other, but uh, you know, realistically, we want to bring data from a database. And, and so I want to focus on Micronaut data next, but I also want to come back and show how we can actually do that with uh, a reactive uh, library as well using R2DBC. And, and both of those are definitely very essential, especially the second one is becoming a lot more attractive as we move on because we want to really do end-to-end -end reactive where we're able to pull the reactive stream of data. You know, to be fair, uh, some databases, predominantly in the new SQL area, have done a better job than relational databases, but that's a, still an area that is definitely improving. And R2DBC is something that's really important to be able to uh, uh, make that possible. So let's take a look at how we can actually make this work. Well, I'm gonna use uh, H2DB in both of these examples. So I don't have to really spend my time and effort spinning a database uh, engine, but it really is something emphasizes how we can actually achieve this. Uh, we saw the feature a few minutes ago about how to really bring in and use the uh, um, feature diff. So we can definitely use that approach here to find out what are the things we need to bring in the Micronaut data. Well, as it turns out, if I want to use Micronaut data, all I have to do is, first of all, go to the build.gradle and bring in some dependencies in here. So obviously, like I said, I'm going to bring in uh, the H2DB, but you also need one more thing. When you are dealing with uh, access to the database, uh, if, you, if you have used uh, tools like Grails or Rails before, there is quite a number of SQL queries that are being generated for you, but those were done using reflection and such. Well, Micronaut, uh, with its emphasis on compile time metaprogramming and uh, AOT, 
key compilation, ahead of time compilation, uh, is going to discover the needs for your queries, but build the query at compile time. So as a result, your bytecode is going to be baked with the queries when you compile the code. So when you run the code, you're not going to invest in really any performance overhead in building these queries. So the queries have been baked. They just need to be executed at that point. And that is one of the nice things you're going to see in this. So I bring in a few different dependencies in here, as you can see. The very first thing I did here was bring in an annotation processor. You want to make sure that appears early ahead in the game. So uh, annotation processor for the Micronaut data processor. And that is very important for us to be able to analyze the code at compile time. So that becomes very important. Then you have a dependency on the Micronaut uh, data, Hibernate JPA. And for runtime itself, I brought in the, uh, the uh, H2DB, as you can see here, that we are going to use. So, so a bunch of dependencies, again, you can use the feature diff to be able to find out what these are and, and drop them in. Well, the next thing I'm going to do here is to go into the application.yml. And, and again, as you can see here, we already have some configurations that we have created, but it's time for us to go on, add a little bit more. So we're going to provide a data source right there. And for the data source, I want to bring in some definitions we're going to use. Where is the data source going to come from? Well, in this particular case, I'm going to say it's JDBC, and this is going to be the H2 database from the uh, memory. And I'll give a name called stock DB, whatever name you want to provide for it. We're dealing with stock information right in here. So I said bring in the stock DB for our purpose to use. And of course, a driver class that I want to use right here. And I'm going to say this is going to really be the r.h2.driver that we're going to be using in. Again, you should be able to pull in most of these things from the diff. You don't have to really remember any of these th things. And you can bring in the necessary features. Similarly, you may want to really configure a few more things. For example, you want to say what dialect you want to use. What uh, uh, do you want to do with the schema? In this case, I want to generate a schema at, at the start uh, of the application because it's just a H2 database and I still want to generate it. And a few other things you want to really think about as well. When you are asking you to generate the schema, obviously, what table is it going to generate? Now, we haven't done the work on this yet, but eventually we're going to do this, but we're going to have the stock as a entity class in a few minutes. So obviously we need a stock table to be generated. Now notice where this is located. It's located in the package called com.agiledeveloper.stockinfo, whatever your product, right? You normally have a company name uh, and product name, et cetera, as a package name. And that's exactly what I want to say in here. So I'm going to say, go ahead and do a entity scan for me ahead of time and look for everything under the hierarchy of package starting from com.agile developer. So this is going to go explore and look for entities in that package. So this is a nice balance between doing everything at compile time but also pointing to what area of the code to analyze so that it can also make things a little bit faster during compile time as well. So we provide a few different configurations as such. So once we do this, again, uh, all these code examples you can download uh, from my website and you can take a look at it readily. I'll give you the URL for this towards the end. So you don't have to write these down at this point so you can easily use it. And I also have a readme file you can take a look at as well to make the journey really easy for you when you wanna try and play with this on your own. So right there, we brought in the dependencies into, and then the configuration in here. Now that takes us readily to one other detail. We obviously want to talk to the database. So for that, we need a interface to perform the query operation. So I create a Java class here called, and actually I'm going to create an interface rather than a class. And this is called the stock repository. And that's basically the name I provided for it called a stock repository. I'm going to annotate this as a repository, as you can see right here. And, and I say this is a repository. Well, obviously, in this case, I need to bring in the dependency. Let me make sure that I brought in the dependency properly in here. So let me ask Gradle to uh, refresh that. Again, if you're using Maven, it's a very similar approach as, as you do. 
And of course, once I brought in the dependency here, I'm going to say repository and mark it as a repository right there. So once I do, I'm going to take this interface and say that it extends from the CRUD repository. And in this case, it's going to be the stock class, but it's also going to use a long as a ID, which I don't have at the moment, but I'm going to bring that in. But then I'm going to say stock and there's going to be the find and I'm going to find it based on a ticker symbol. Well, life couldn't be any easier because the query is going to get generated for us automatically. So we don't have to spend the time and effort uh, you know, producing those queries. So that's basically the interface that I developed right here to say that I want a stock repository to bring in the CRUD repository on the stock and the ID of long, a primary key. And then of course the finder method I'm gonna ask for is to get back from the ticker, uh, the, the stock itself. There are other finders that are available as well from the CRUD repository, but this is very specific to what I'm gonna look for. We did mark it as executable. So I'm gonna yield for a minute and uh, I'm gonna uh, uh, request uh, Graham to comment on uh, what benefit do we get by marking it as executable uh, at this point? Um, so I don't think you need to mark it as executable. Uh, if you want to, if you can, if you, if you do, what happens there is if you mark it as executable, then it will uh, generate a compilation time, a compilation time method handle that you can invoke the method with dynamically if you wanted to. Um, so rather than using reflection, it would generate what's called an executable method, which you can look up and uh, invoke the, the method dynamically in a reflection-free manner. Um, it depends if you're going to do that, if you, if you need that feature or not, uh, whether you would mark it as executable or not. Um, but it, it, that executable, the benefit of it is it allows you to invoke methods um, dynamically without the need to use the traditional Java reflection, which is lower and has more overhead in terms of execution. I, I did notice one other thing. I don't know where that feature is coming from, but but I did, you know, with my, with my exceptional skill to type incorrectly all the time, I put it as a ticket one, one, one time and, and I did get an error pretty much saying there's no such field. And, and that I thought was actually quite brilliant as well. So leaning in on some of the meta information is, is quite useful uh, to get some of those uh, maybe ahead of time, not only compilation, but ahead of time errors as well. I think it's pretty good solid uh, reasoning yeah. here. Yeah. yeah, that's one of my, my favorite features of Vagrant Data is that, you, know, you don't have to wait until runtime before it'll tell you like actively, hey, this is like not a valid query. So I can't compile this. I don't know what to do with it. So just like don't even bother starting out, yep. right? Um, so because uh, one of the criticisms of solutions like this um, historically has been, you know, it's um, very dynamic and, um, yeah, you know, uh, not as like statically typed. Uh, you know, the hard, the hardcore static typing people like, uh, you know, this, this is like not that check. And uh, with micro data, that's not the case, right? Everything is typed that in your queries. So. Uh, in fact, you, if you there's another cool thing, like if, for example, if you put um, int in, int instead of string for the ticker, for example, um, it would it would fail compilation as well because the type doesn't match, so it doesn't it will fail compilation at that point as well. So, so this is one of the uh, places where you can have a cake and as it eats it. Uh, you know, in yeah. the past, this is one of my complaints has been that meta programming is so awesome. But, but you have to compromise on compile time uh, facilities. So now you are bringing both the both, best of the both worlds together. You, I can have meta programming and have static typing at the same time. So that, that is like a double bonus, which, which is pretty awesome uh, a feature to really enjoy. So I love that part. Um, yeah. so, so once we uh, uh, introduce that uh, repository, uh, we obviously want to do dependency injection to get access to it, which we will do in just about a minute. Um, but let's go ahead and make one change to the stock uh, uh, to make it an entity, if you will. So I'm going to go back here to the stock and say this is going to become an entity. So we'll mark it as entity. And then a few minor changes I want to make in here. 
I want to make it as an ID and a generated value of the uh, value of a private, let's say, uh, a long, and this is going to be an integer, let's say, ID, a long ID. And we want to really provide a getter and setter for that as well. But let's go ahead and say, here comes the long ID. And we will simply say this dot ID is equal to the given ID. And then finally, we'll go ahead and provide a, a maybe a getter and a setter for that as well uh, for the ID. And we'll select that and provide those two fields right in there. So, so that really turned this into a um, stock, as we can see, into an entity, not a whole, whole lot of effort. But of course, the last step we want to perform here is to finally uh, give a relief to our service, which was faking all this data all the time. And so we can say, no service, you don't have to do that anymore. So let's get rid of all of that for a minute. And then what we can do here is to make the service a little bit more powerful here as well. So what we will do in the service is, first of all, let's go ahead and bring in a private stock repository. And here comes the stock repository. And let's go ahead and write the constructor for the service itself, where we will bring in the stock repository and wire that together. Again, a dependency injection provided for us with almost no effort. So all I'm going to do then is to say iterable on the stock. And the get stocks is going to simply say the stock repository dot, and we'll call the find all function. Now, remember, when we wrote the stock repository, we wrote our find function right here. However, we can readily call the find all function, which knows to return a stock, iterable on a stock, so we don't have to really do extra effort. That comes from the base class base interface that we implemented at that point. So we get that for free, as you can see. So similarly, we're going to create a stock and say get stock, which is going to take a ticker symbol. Let's go ahead and provide the ticker right there. And then here we'll say return the stock repository and the find of the ticker and return it. Now, I'm going to provide one more thing right here, a stock, and I'm going to say save stock. And this is going to take a stock as an argument. And all that's going to do is to simply return the stock repository dot save. And in this case, I'm going to simply save the given stock and then return the value that we get back from it at this point to say, that's what I'm going to return back from this call. So that's a save call to the stock. So we provided those three functions, as you can see right there. So one that is going to return all the stocks for us, one that returns a stock given a ticker symbol, and then finally one that's going to return back, uh, uh, save a stock and return the stock back to us. Well, we are almost done with that. The last step here is to go to the controller. And the controller, of course, already has a dependency injection on a service, but Micronaut is smart enough to wire the service with the repository and then wire that into the controller for us so we don't have to put any extra effort. One of the other things also, I'm a huge fan of automated testing and unit testing, and it's almost trivial to be able to stub away or mark away the stock service and then test your controller. I'll show you an example of that later on in the context of uh, providing uh, some verification later on. So back in the controller, what am I going to do? All I'm going to do is to go to the controller, and I'm going to get rid of the uh, uh, functions that we have here. We'll come back to these later on. But this all goes away, as you can see. And we simply say uh, the stock service dot, and we'll say find, in this case, uh, the get stock, rather, and then return the stock for the given ticker and simply put a return on it and return it. So that greatly simplified our controller to simply route the call to the service and return the uh, a value for us. Uh, we're almost here, but uh, what point is it to run this without being able to see some sample data? So I wanna tweak this a little bit if you don't mind. So I'm gonna come into the application and mark it as a singleton like so. And then I'm gonna say that this implements at this point an application event listener with a service start event as a service startup event as an interface. So as a result, I can ask it now to override the method on application event. And, and within this, I can, first of all, I need a stock service, which I can inject. So I can say, here comes a stock service. And now that I asked Micronaut to inject that service for me, I can simply say stock service dot. And in this case, we can simply say dot save stock. 
and I can say a new stock. And, and what do I want to save? Well, I want the ID to be auto-generated. We'll provide an ORCL as the a ticker symbol, and let's provide an AD as a price, and then we will perform a save on that particular stock. Let's do a couple of them right here. So let's go ahead and say this is uh, MSFT. Let's go ahead and say this is going to be a Goog, and let's say this is uh, AMZN, and, and so provide um, a few things. So there we go. And let's go ahead and say this is going to be uh, 1180 and uh, uh, maybe a 3180 and so on. So we'll provide some arbitrary stock prices. And this is basically going to be invoked and it can allow us to save the stock price while the application actually starts up just to provide a sample data. Obviously, when you talk to a real database, you're going to get the data from the database. You wouldn't need that particular step af after all. So when I try this, what it's complaining, it's telling me uh, primary repository operation, uh, you know, make sure the bean is disabled by event. So a bunch of error that we need to deal with at this point, let's just make sure we got all the things lined up properly. So I go in here, I have the annotation processor that I've created right there, where I provided the H2 database. I go into the application, let me make sure I configured this properly in the YML, and I provided the data source like so, and provided the URL for that and the driver as well. And then of course I have the uh, JPA configuration initialized right there. Going into the repository itself, I think I've get, uh, got that figured uh, correctly. And I have the uh, uh, ID gener as a generator and entity. So, and then of course the service. So let's see where that error is actually uh, coming from. So it's telling me, that no backing repository operation was defined. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, uh, I've noticed this error to come about when I forgot to do some configurations in here, but I think I did that properly. So I'm a little bit of a loss where that may come from. So let me make sure to refresh this and try it again. Um, so uh, let's go back here and um, go to the application one more time. And let me try to fire this up and see if it is able to kick in. Nope, still uh, having the problem. So let me see, uh, any any uh, thoughts on this, uh, Graham? Um, let's have a look at your, um, go back to your Builder Gradle. Uh, which one again? The Builder Gradle. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So you got data processor, I'm going to do that. Tomcat H2. Mm. Try it. Um, try one thing. Um, go into the application class. And instead of using application event listener, um, Annotate the method with at event listener that on application event thing. So this one here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so annotate it with one? Uh, at event listener. Right. And remove the remove the override. So this would go away as well. Yeah. I actually don't know if this will make a difference, but anyway, just try run it okay. again. I thought that was like an unusual way to do things, but. So no. um, um, no exception, that's what it's saying, primary repository operations. Um, uh, let's see, go back, go to um, your log back set uh, XML. Log back, log back XML, and add a logger called io.micronaut.context.condition. Okay, so that's going to give us a better report, you're saying? Yes. Okay, so where do you want me to add that here? Uh, uh, create a new logger definition and uh, underneath the root. Uh, so angle bracket logger name. Uh, logo space. No, it's uh, the name is an attribute. So it's just logo. And 
name equal uh, with the attribute name equals uh, iod dot micronaut dot context dot condition level equals trace. Uh, is it a uh... and my attributes? Yeah. True. Yeah. Trace. Trace. Uh, so you a want trace. a trace? A trace. Yeah. Try it. Just run that and see what happens. Ooh. Okay. So let's see the output of um. Scroll up, scroll up. Uh, scroll up. Okay, so if you search for um, JPA in there, in that list. So um, yeah, I keep searching. So will not be loaded to be failed condition. It says master registry yeah. is not present. And the next one. Uh, next one. No, it's not that. Uh, nope. Okay, so uh, let's just recover from this for now uh, for debugging purposes. So let me uh, see if I can restore from an example I have here and, and bring that in. So what's going on in this case is I've, I've occasionally run into a situation like this one where uh, it uh, messes up with um, the configuration. And the last time I remember, if my memory serves me right, was that I did not have a proper uh, configuration set up for, for some of these things in the build. So I'm gonna just verify this one more time to make sure I got everything I need in here. So we have a client runtime classic and validation discovery. So we have a processor, we have a JPA, we have Tomcat, database Tomcat and H2 database. So it looks like that's what I needed right there. I don't think I had any other configurations in the build. Uh, so I'm gonna scroll that up and uh, okay. So the, that's one thing. I want to also verify my um, work with the uh, stock class itself, where I define the singleton and entity, rather the stock class itself. Let's take a look at the stock class. So we have the uh, ID uh, stock. One of the things I've also gotten back in the past is where it will tell me the table has not been created uh, properly. And, and again, that's not the case in this particular example. So that seems to be fine in here. So I don't see that uh, happening. So uh, then, the, of course, I want to check my, huh? Can you try and remove the entity scan definition in um, application.yaml? All right. So that top one there just removed the, the, the entity, entity scan. So this remove this one here? Mm -hmm. Those two lines, yeah. OK. Um, let me double check quickly here with my application so all right still no avail no nope um all right so uh that one i have a jpa default entity scan properties okay so let me do a, a, a boot from my a uh, working example and bring that in and see if that actually helps a little bit. It's quite possible that I have a configuration that's incorrect in here. So uh, let me try that really quickly. And, and, and I'm just gonna fall back because I know that part actually worked before uh, in here. So I'll go ahead and fire that up. If, if not, we'll move on and we'll, we'll, uh, I'll post my example that works and then we can try it again. So looks like, okay, so there we go. So what actually I had done is most likely I had fat fingered something in the application.yml. 
So I couldn't it's, see it's, it either. So it's, it's good that yeah, we yeah. I, I couldn't see it either. <laughs> this is one of the reasons I commit my code quite frequently as well. I, I'm really good at fat fingering <laughs> it to the configuration. So I apologize for that error right there. So, uh, so it was an issue in the application. And that's where I've run in the past as well, where I made some mistakes here. Maybe an indentation error. It was not pulling. That's quite possible. We all love uh, YAML for that reason, isn't it? Uh, so uh, that's basically where it came from. So that pulled in the data, as you can see. Now let's go ahead and fire up the client side code. A little journey through that, but uh, nevertheless, and go ahead and fire up the client side code and execute it. See if it wants to bring back the data. This time, of course, the data coming from the database in, in, in here. So let's fire it up and see what it wants to tell us. So when we execute this, we can see that it's making the request and you can see from the data, it's an 80 and 180, as you can see. But nevertheless, we can just go back here just to be sure. Let's go ahead and say this is gonna be our, uh, let's say a uh, Goog and let's change this to a, uh, um, AMZN and then run and, and make sure the data is coming back. So, so that's one of the things to be careful about is to make sure the configurations are uh, properly done and, and no syntax error in it can be a little bit painful uh, from time to time. I've, I've had my share of struggle with that. So that's basically the uh, output that you see from the database that came through. So let's talk a little bit about what we did just to quickly uh, refresh uh, uh, our um, memory on what actually happened uh, through this particular exercise. So the things we did in here uh, quickly to go over, no change to the client side, obviously, but on the server side going to the build, we brought in those dependencies for the database, as you can see. Then the next step is to configure the application.yml. And I would say this is probably the gnarliest part in here is to make sure we provide the dependency properly in here. And of course, the JPA uh, dependency that we brought in for, uh, for the meta programming part that, that we talked about. The next step in here is to go into the um, stock repository. We created this to say that it's a CRUD operation we perform on the stock and the long is the ID. And then we also took the stock itself and we made that into a entity and then we declared a primary key for it. So that's pretty much, and of course the constructor takes in the data and the getters and setters for it. Well, the next step after this was to go to the service and remove the fake data but did a dependency injection bringing in the stock repository. And then of course we are using that to make the queries. This is the method we had uh, uh, written in the interface. These are already part of the interface and we are able to readily use it. Once again, like we talked about in the part one, if you were to jump in here into the uh, generated bytecode, you should be able to take a look at the generated classes right here and the queries are being developed right there at compile time. So you don't have to waste your time and effort at runtime uh, using uh, reflection. So those are really available. And like we talked about, you'll also get compile time errors if you were to make a mistake in any one of those. And of course, the very final step in here is to go to the controller and, and simply use the service to bring the uh, persistent data. And it also shows an example of saving the data as well, where we just call the save stock and created some initial stock data for us to provide. So that's the part that actually worked. Well, while that's great, what if I really want to perform a, a request with the reactive data? Well, this is one of the reasons why we talked about this in part one and Graham was mentioning this uh, in the previous uh, part one, uh, a change in uh, Micronaut going from using RxJava to Reactor for Reactive API. And then part of the reason for that is to be able to support access to uh, uh, the, the reactive queries to the databases as well. So in that regard, I wanna spend a couple of minutes talking about a few things we need to be familiar with. Uh, one of them is when it comes to reactive API, we talk about flow of data. So it's a RR data, RR data stream. So if you look at Java stream versus a reactive stream, they both are a pipeline of data. But the reactive stream API itself gives us the data channel, the error channel, and also the complete channel. So the API is quite different in terms of how the data flows and how the error flows as well. But having said that, uh, the, the reactor provides two sets of classes that we need to be uh, comfortable with. One is a mono and the other is a, a, a flux. 
but both are uh, publishers, if you will. So a publisher is just a, a data emitter. That's what it really is. So a data emitter may emit data. Then what's the difference between mono and flux? A mono may emit at most, if you will, one data. On the other hand, a flux may emit a zero, a one, a, or any number of data. So it may be unbounded, if you will. But both mono and the flux will give you a complete signal when there is no more data coming through. And we can benefit from those very nicely. So let's put those ideas together here to see how we can uh, turn this into a reactive API and see how we can access this particular data. So the first thing I wanna do here is to go into the build.gradle and I'm gonna change the database related stuff right in here. So going into the service, let's go to the build.gradle file. And in here, we are gonna modify this part to say, I wanna use R2DBC. Why is it called R2DBC? It's a reactive relational database query. That's why the R2 comes in. It's a reactive relational database query. And then obviously in this case, you wanna take the relational data, but provide it as a flux or a mono. So we're still gonna use the H2DB right in here. So we brought in that dependency like so. So once we do, our next step in here is to go into the application and configure. So this time I'm not gonna be trying to be smart enough to type it, but I'm gonna just take it, copy and paste it to avoid uh, errors. So I'm gonna to go to the application.xml, YML, and change that right in here to bring in the dependency to the data source. So I say R2DBC, and it's gonna be using the stock DB and a few other configurations for bringing in the database that we are providing right in here. So that's basically a, a little change from the rational API that we saw a few minutes ago. But quite a few other things are gonna change here as well. Most notably, the first thing we wanna start with is our entity to begin with. So what is our entity going to do at this point? Well, the entity is going to use a different set of uh, you know, API. So going back to the stock itself, you can see the stock class is going to uh, provide in this case, rather than let's get rid of these because those APIs are not being used anymore. We'll say this is a mapped entity that we bring in. And uh, of course the ID as before, we're gonna still use it. And then we are also gonna use the generated value as well. So we'll just bring those in. So that's the only change I made right now is to run this to a mapped entity. Uh, the repository is gonna change substantially. So going into the repository, what are we gonna do? In the repository, we are going to say that this repository is going to be a, a R2 a DB repository. And the dialect I want to use is going to be a dialect dot H2 is the dialect we're going to use to talk to the H2 uh, database. Uh, so then uh, what, what we're going to do in here is to modify this request to be a reactive stream, a CRUD repository with a stock and a long like we did before, except for a couple of small changes. We're gonna first of all say a mono, remember zero or one of a stock and the find is gonna take a string ticker and return it. So this says I'm gonna return back a mono as you can see from here within the um, uh, reactor core publisher mono. And then of course, one more thing, we're gonna put a flux in here where it's a flux of a stock and that's going to be uh, going to be a find all that's going to return all the stock prices that would exist. Now that we modified the repository, uh, what we want to do is to go to the service, which is using that. So in the service, we bring in the repository, but in here, this is going to become a flux rather than an iterable, as you would expect. Similarly, this becomes a mono of a stock. And then finally, this becomes a mono of a stock as well uh, that we're gonna return from these particular calls. So what are we gonna do with the service itself at this point? Well, the service is gonna return back uh, those uh, objects. Well, a small difference here, we'll come back to this in a minute, but this one is gonna do a find all return the flux of it. This is gonna be a find the ticker and return the mono for that particular ticker. But this one, the save actually returns a publisher rather than a mono. 
But if you're curious about this, a publisher is actually a base interface from a mono. So if you were to uh, go back and look at the mono, right, like so, you will notice that the mono is actually, uh, uh, oops, uh, let's, it's still loading. There we go. Is is actually a code publisher, which in turn is a publisher. So that's basically what it is. And this is simply returning a publisher when you call the save function. So, so that gives us an idea about how the repository changed to have these uh, provided like so. Well, with that said, let's go over here to our controller this time. And in the controller, we're going to return a mono of a stock when you make a request for it. So that's basically what we're going to return from this uh, from uh, in response to the uh, controller itself. But while we are here, let's do a couple of more things. So we can also add a get. And in the get, I'm going to say public flux of a stock. And this is going to be get stocks, if you will. And that simply is going to go back to the stock service and return all the stocks available. And that becomes a nice little API for returning a reactive stream, if you will. So now let's go back to the application. And a few things, again, change in the application itself. Notice that this is returning a publisher. Now, if you have played with the reactive API, you know this already, that it's a lazy evaluation. So until you subscribe, the evaluation doesn't happen. Well, the nice thing is it's lazy. The bad thing is it's lazy. So you have to do a little bit more work to perform that uh, operation. So what I'm going to do here is to uh, simply go back to this one and call the save. But the save is going to return to us a publisher. So I'm going to go ahead and cast that one here to a, a mono of stock. And then I'm going to simply go ahead and call uh, over here a, a little block command so that I can make sure that it evaluates and actually saves the data. So, so this is going to become our MSFT. This is going to become the Goog. This is going to become the AMZN. And of course, the price values, let's go ahead and just type them in. And uh, finally, the values came in. And we are doing, doing a block on that to go ahead and save the data. Let's fire up and execute the application right now. So, so this is uh, really running the server, but using the HD, uh, H2 database, using a reactive stream uh, API. So if you really want to, you could go back over here to the command prompt, and in the command prompt, you could perform the query on it and see what it wants to return back to you. Uh, of course, uh, the port number is dynamic this time. So let's go ahead and find out what the port number is, if I can find it really quickly right here. So once it starts up, uh, let's see uh, where that information is uh, displayed. Uh, so uh, so you, once you should I probably find turn off all that logging. Uh, oh, yeah, you are right, actually. Thank you. So um, yeah, that's uh, flooding that right there. Thank you very much. So uh, fire it up again. And uh, uh, let's take a look at the uh, uh, information right there is 57458. Uh, I'm going to just use that information in here. Try this again. And uh, so that's going to be the request. And you can see that's the data that came back from that particular service. And what about the client side? Really quickly, a very little change to the client. First of all, back in the client side, I'm going to go over to the build.gradle really quickly. But I'm going to make only one change here to the client. And, and that is on the client side, all I want to bring in is simply the dependency to the R2DB. So I'm going to just drop that in as a R2DB into the client side, as you can see. So, so that helps, helps me to bring in the dependency on the client side. And uh, once I bring in the client side dependency, that's the build.gradle that you saw. And um, once I do, uh, that says, you know, give me the dependency on the reactor API nicely pulled in through that dependency. So then I can go to the client side and I can say, hey, this one here on the client is going to be giving me a mono rather than simply providing me a stock information, right? Because that's what we're going to be receiving at this point. So I'm going to say for the ticker, this becomes a mono of the stock like so. And then similarly, I can also say a get but this one is going to be a flux of a stock, and that's going to be get stocks, if you will, that I'm going to return back for all the stocks I want to uh, receive. So, so that brings us, again, uh, going back to the build.gradle file, 
I need to make sure that I ask it to pull in the dependency. And, and once it does, I can go back here and pull in the dependency for mono and the flux as well from the reactor. So with, the, with only that change, what am I going to do? The next step in here is to go back to the uh, run. And in this case, if I run this now, of course, it's going to give me a mono as a response, which is not really that helpful, obviously, right? So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to do a little bit of a different API. You know, uh, I, I could use a block, but I'll be honest about it. Every time I use a block, I cry a little bit because I don't like to take something that's naturally non-blocking and make it blocking. So I'm going to do something a little different right here. I'm going to create a, count, a, a countdown latch, and I'll say the latch is going to be equal to a countdown latch of one for now. And then I'm going to say the stock client dot get stocks, let's call the get stocks function dot subscribe and system dot out print line. And I'll print the result as we get it. Uh, and so I'll say print line. And then I'll also do system dot uh, out. And this is going to be for the error if there were any. But then the last one here is going to be the complete signal. And I'm going to simply say latch dot. Uh, you know, count down on that one. And then finally, I can say latch dot await termination. Let's give it some time. It doesn't require that much time, but we'll just provide a little bit of time for it to uh, wait on it. And then of course, I'll simply provide that, that as a surround with try catch and let's go ahead and execute that little code. So this time around, it's gonna pull in all the stock prices from the server using the reactive API. And, and right there, you notice, that we got the prices from the server for each one of the stock prices that we got back. So that's an example of how easy it was to really bring in the reactive API and, and display it. Uh, I've also used this with other things like Mongo. So you don't need an RTODBC if you're gonna work with that. Uh, databases like Mongo already give you the reactive API and you can pull that in and you can use them as well. So you can do th things like that very nicely. Well, we got about uh, roughly about uh, you know uh, seven minutes or so with us, but I want to see if there are any questions and then jump in and I want to show you two examples of uh, uh, writing contracts and how we can do. This really came from the question from the last presentation. Somebody wanted to talk about Swagger, so we decided to add something related to that. But I want to yield to see if there are any questions or comments before we move forward. One comment interact. that was made was one comment that was made in the YouTube channel. I think was that um, sorry, was that um, uh, why you have why save and find one return to the publisher and one returned mono. I think it was in your example. Um, and I and I think the answer to that is um, the uh, stock repository you have. I think. Uh, I think your stock repository uh, subclass is reactive streams credit repository. But I think if you sub, if you extended a reactor sub, uh, reactor credit repository instead, um, uh, then um, then it would uh, it would work. I don't see the it's being pulled in here. I think it's reactor tor. Uh, yeah, I probably didn't wire the dependency properly in here. Yeah, that one is in uh, Microsoft Data R2 EBC. Um, so yeah, there is an there is another interface in the Microsoft Data R2 EBC module that allows you to get reactor operators for the different methods. To answer that question. Okay. Ole, did you have anything else to add? No, no, that was actually what I wanted to uh, point your attention to as well. Do you know, there is also a question from Sivaram uh, in the chat, if there are any sessions or any information on gRPC and Micronaut together? Uh, um, there aren't, but I think that would be a great subject uh to cover in a future stream so that's a fantastic suggestion the next time uh we're streaming over uh we can uh talk about micronaut and grpc excellent noted 
All right, so I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the Swagger and give an example right here. So going into the build.gradle, I wanna quickly show how we can do this. So I'm bringing in the uh, reference to uh, open API. Again, if you use the feature diff, you'll be able to see this very easily. I just literally copied and pasted from there. So here is the open API and a Swagger annotation we brought in. While we are here within the uh, file build.gradle, I wanna show one more thing you can do quite nicely. So in the build.gradle, and again, you can do similar things with Maven as well, is I bring in a, com a, com a compiler uh, 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 flag here to say, I wanna turn on the o open API view spec feature to enable swag swagger UI enabled is equal to true. So I made these two configurations. Again, you can see this in the, uh, in the uh, uh, example, I'll uh, let you download and play with it later on, but I just added those two right in there. Once I do this, that's my build.gradle as you can see, and I'm gonna just pull in the dependency. The next thing is, this is actually pretty interesting how you can do this with almost no effort at all. So I go into the application itself and, and in the application, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put a little one annotation right here as called an open API definition and, and just simply say that it's a stock info that I wanna bring in. Well, one last change we wanna make here before we call this done, uh, this is quite sufficient already to produce the configuration information for the um, API. However, I'm gonna go over to the application.yml and in the application YML, I'm gonna add over here, right after we provide the port number, I'm gonna say router and ask it to generate a, a, a routing to the Swagger UI uh, very easily. So with all that configuration done, I wanna change one more thing here. I wanna to go to my controller and I ask it to go into my stocks right now and then the ticker so I don't have any conflict with the Swagger uh, UI. So with that done, Let's go ahead and fire this up really quickly, right? So very minimum change I made, uh, didn't have to write any code for it. One little annotation and a few configuration changes later, we fire this up and execute it. But really quickly, if you look into the build and you go into the classes meta INF, what you're gonna notice up here is that it's gonna build in the details for Swagger to come in and, and provide you the details right in here. So let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, information in here. Oh, it quite didn't pull it in yet, but let me see why. So in this case, uh, let me make sure that I uh, uh, made the change to the build Gradle, and I did make the change to build Gradle. And uh, let me just refresh this really quickly to be sure it took it in. And then of course, I go back to the application itself and um, make sure that my application contains the uh, yeah, annotation. I think it's the, your, your file system was just out of sync. Uh, it is weird oh, now. So is it, is it now, uh, did it, oh, there we go. So let it pull in. Yes, I did, did notice there's a delay in bringing this in. There you go, thank you. Yeah, I just was a little slow in bringing that in. So right there is the file that you see that got generated with the Swagger uh, uh, you know, documentation that you can look at. But what's also exciting about this is you can go to the URL and in the URL, you can ask for the Swagger UI. And, and once you do, you can actually look at this and play with this quite uh, nicely, if you will. So for example, if I go into the uh, stocks like so, and I click on the try it out, and I click on execute, it literally goes and makes a request to the application and, and pulls in the live data right there, and you can take a look at it. And, and similarly, if I were to go into this here, I can look at the documentation right there, look at the specifications, but if you really wanna try it out, I can also do that right here and ask for, let's say, Goog and click on execute. And you can see that it pulls in the data for that as well, right in there. So with almost no effort, uh, and this is what uh, Graham was mentioning last time, is that you don't have to do much effort at all. And, and uh, you can just, pull the data very easily with a little bit of configuration. And that's exactly what I did. So the things I really changed were very, very minimum. And, and just to quickly mention one more thing about uh, contract verification. I'm a huge fan of verifying that the code actually works. 
And for this often time, you want to really not only be able to write your contracts, but you want to be able to know that your contracts actually work. So for that, I'm going to show you a very, very quick example of how you can build in this contract. And, and, and then I'll talk about where you can find this example as well. So really quickly, I want to show you right here uh, the things I've done. So this is purely a test, if you will. So I want to show you the test, first of all, before we go any further. So notice what I did here. This is the client side code. And I said it's a Micronaut test. And I said it's a packed test for a stock info on a particular port. And I said that I want to go ahead and call the stock price for Goog, but I want to know that the price came back to one, two, three, four. But notice I said it's a packed for the packed receiver's uh, stock price, where I am telling what the format of the data should be that the client is expecting. But, but when I run this test, it's going to produce a, a file, a packed file, but where is it going to put it? Well, I asked it to put it under the common slash packed directory. So that way the directory is shared by the client and the server. Then when I run the test, it's going to use this as a mock, produce a one, two, three, four, and verify that this is the output, but also will take the structure of the data and store it into a common file. So that that's on the client side. I want to quickly show you the server side, how this actually looks like on the server. So again, on the test on the server side, if you will, let me show you how this is going to look like. So on the server side, though, notice I say it's a stock info, but I'm going to get it from the common packed directory, the same directory where the client put the packed file. I'm asking you to pull it from there. Then, of course, there's a problem. My controller uses a service. The service talks to the database. I don't want that. So what I'm saying is, here is my stock service, but notice I mock away using Makito, the stock service, and I create a mock object. Then in my test, I am asking it to return for the Google stock price, a fake response of a mono of a one Goog, one, two, three, four, like so. So I tell it to really produce a fake response in this call rather than going to the real database. So this will bypass the real service and use a mock service. And the rest of it is simply saying, verify that the output produced by the controller matches with the output specified in the packed file. So, so this can be a nice contract you can verify in addition to running your automated test, unit test, and integration test. This can be a contract between the client and the server. And, and so if you're using PACT, that literally is the effort that takes to really uh, write a contract specification and verify that as well. And again, it's really trivial to get that implemented. And it works really nicely with Micronaut's test. I, I've done this with other uh, frameworks before. Doing it with Micronaut was uh, almost no effort. Simply just carry over those ideas here and, and applied it very readily. Uh, again, uh, so you can take a look at that and play with it later on. Uh, if you are interested in. So where do you find these examples that I provided right here? Well, if you want to look at these examples, you can download them from, I'll put the link in here uh, in just about a minute, but that's where I loaded these files. If you're interested in uh, accessing them, uh, you may want to note that down. Uh, so this is where you can download it from. And those are already there along with the readme file that shows you what configurations you need to create as well. So I'll just put that as download right there. So that's all I have. I'll, I'll yield to see if there are any final questions uh, or any uh, comments from either uh, Oleg or um, uh, Graham before we wrap this up. Thank you. Right, I have a Thanks. question from, from Mani here in the chat. Uh, and this is a little bit of a philosophical question if I, if I correctly interpret that. So, Mani is asking, how do we get ourselves well versed with the stack uh, Reactive plus Java and plus Reactive plus Micronaut? Um, what's the what would be your general advice? So, so my my ad advice is uh, do it incrementally. Uh, you know, for me, uh, it becomes overwhelming if I try to take way too many things at one shot. Uh, for me, it, when I struggled with reactive programming. 
my journey really was to really hit, uh, wrap my head around what it really means. And, and once uh, you know, I realized reactive programming is much like a functional programming plus plus, you're dealing with a stream API, but then you build on it a back pressure and, and, and a few other ways in which you handle error, it became a lot more easier for me to embrace the idea. So a lot of times I would say, uh, go to your fundamentals and find that incremental leap from your fundamental to the next step. And then from there to the next step, that seems to be a lot better way in general for me to learn things rather than trying to take something completely strange and try to relate to it. So, so that journey really helped me a lot. In a similar way for Micronaut, again, I've done grails quite a bit in the past. I've looked at uh, things like Spring in the past. It was bridging, bridging, uh, bridging that increment to say, here's how it's similar, here's how it's diff different. Always that incremental approach seems to help me a lot better. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I think um, another thing that kind of incrementally helped me understand um, Rx Java and, and Reactor and so forth was actually initially the um, you know the streams API in in Java, right? Because uh, which is not reactive, right? But it, it's it's kind of the, you almost need to take the shift to more kind of functional programming where it, you look with in a similar way that streams work with you know, things like map and, and so forth and those kinds of methods um, to transform a stream. And uh, when you when you think about uh, Rx Java and, and Reactor in the same way, I it's like a stream and you can map it and flap it, flap map it and, and, <laughs> and transform it and filter it and, and so forth. Then, um, then it's a lot easier to rationalize, I think, um, that you were essentially working with a stream of data. Uh, so that, that helped me at least in that process. Excellent advice. I, I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, there are also, also some questions about Swagger and the annotations. For example, uh, Govind Raj is asking, do Swagger annotations work uh, on a class when it's only annotated with a controller? Oh, no, do the Swagger annotations only work when the class is annotated with controller? Uh, can it be like interfaces or something like this? So uh, the class does need to be annotated with a controller, but if I understand this question correctly, you can have the, you know, the other annotations like get and post and whatever on the interface that the, that the controller implements. So those would be inherited by the controller and then inherited by the Swagger. So that so that does work of like finding them in an interface that you uh, that you can use in your testing and so forth. Uh, and you know the really nice thing thing as well, um, which um, Venkat didn't have time to demonstrate with, I'm sure, is that is that you can uh, put Java dot comments into your um, controllers and so forth and your your interface with them. And uh, Micronaut will actually read those Java comments and propagate them into your Swagger definition, uh, so you don't have to like duplicate, you know, writing the, the same documentation in two places. And um, and because Micronaut processes the source code of your your um, application, it's able to see the Java comments and populate your Swagger definition with those, which is pretty neat. Neat, I think. And if I may add, uh, the documentation uh, site for Micronaut and Swagger is pretty extensive. It, it's to be, it's, to be honest, a bit more overwhelming than I, I could take in one shot, but there's a lot of details in there that you can look at as well. Yeah, because you know, there's different, you showed Swagger UI, but we have support as well for different UI generators like RDoc and all sorts of things. and. Uh, and there's ways to like merge different schemas and import schemas from already compiled libraries. And you know, it's a very flexible library that has many different, different options. And of course you can use the Swagger annotations themselves. Um, um, I think I demonstrated one, which was the at uh, open API annotation, I think, but, but there are many others like, like, um, like at operation and so forth where you can customize how the output um, is um, so they can hide certain operations or show certain operations at open API definition. That's one, yeah. 
So uh, yeah, but there's many, many, you know, the whole suite of, uh, of annotations which Raga supported. Right. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think there are, there are, there are some questions about uh, to processor and block uh, and unblock and lazy in reactive programming, but they are a little bit off topic as mentioned by the author of those questions as well. So I think we can we can uh, leave them aside and just handle them uh, offline through any kind of other interactions. Right, so if we if we, if we we think about that actually, right, what could be the follow-up? This is the second part of the webinar, which is there is unfortunately no third part scheduled as far as I understand. <laughs> uh, uh, where, what would be the next steps for anyone watching? Uh, where would you recommend them to go? So all the demos and the code and the, uh, the uh, examples are available on the agiledeveloper.com slash downloads. Uh, what what else do they need to know? Personally, I I would say uh, prototype prototype uh, 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 you know sample of an application you're working on, and and that's what really got me hooked to Micronaut is not reading about it but actually using it, and then the more I started prototyping with it, the more I fell in love with it. So I would say uh, you know part three would be for uh, anyone who is uh, you know taking this to the next level is I would urge you to start prototyping it incrementally. Uh, you know, sure, play with the examples that you have, but a much better realistic uh, way is to take a use case scenario that you have at work and then prototype it and see how that works. I think that's a great way to learn and to take it forward to apply as well. Right, excellent advice. Graham, do you have any any Final advice: Where to go from here? I mean, you know, my card is you know different is different things to different people. I think that you know that's this this has been focused on the uh, microservices area, but you know there are folks using it for ELI apps and and you know recently I look we did one on message driven microservices. Um, so there's really a lot of different directions you can take it in, but, but like Venka said, it's like, um, start small and, and try things out and, uh, and, um, and then go from there. You know, uh, we have doc great documentation resources and great guides, um, a great community as well. Come join us on, on, on Gitter and chat if you have questions and want to ask, um, uh, you know, there's a lot going on around Micronauts, so, uh, and it's exciting time to it is a very exciting time it is a very exciting time right thank you very much Graham thank you massively massively Venkat this was an excellent part two of the webinar the part one is available on YouTube the part two will be available on YouTube or you're watching it right now so so I don't know like and subscribe as they say uh, we're gonna have more streams uh, about GraalVM, about Micronaut, about the adjacent technologies there uh, on those channels as well. So stay tuned. Next week, we'll already have the release unboxing stream planned. So that is scheduled and that's what we're going to have. And thank you very much for, for that. Uh, thank you for today. Bye-bye. Mm, thank you.